Very good. All right, you guys should all be able to hear me okay. Excellent. Good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, just trying to get my my internet's just been kind of popping in and out this morning, so I've had a hard time establishing a uh, stream for today's lecture. But uh, I think I think we should be good to go now. Let me move this over here. Pop this over here. Okay. So. Um, where we left off in the story last time, just to recap a little bit, we started talking about the French Revolution. I have to, folks, um, I'm going to talk quietly today because I have to conserve my voice. I've been, I've, as a teacher, you get used to projecting your voice and talking very loudly. Um, but, you know, I'm, basically what I have discovered is between the several classes that I'm teaching, um, my my voice is um, wearing down earlier than it usually does, and um, so to try to preserve my voice a little bit, um, I am going to talk more quietly um, because I found that even when I'm sitting here in front of an empty class lecturing on the computer over the stream, um, I've I've find that I'm talking very, very loudly and it's wearing down my voice. So I'm going to do my best to keep the volume of my voice down um, so that I can preserve it because I'm, I'm really using my voice a whole lot and if I lose it, I'll be in big trouble. So, okay, <clears throat> let's, um, let's do just a little bit of recap here, okay, on the things that we talked about last week pertaining to the French Revolution, okay? So, <clears throat> um, what, what we began talking about last time is that there were three estates in France, okay? There were three estates. Think of these as, okay, let me see if I can turn up my volume a little bit here. Is this a little better? Is that too loud? Is that maybe... Good morning to you, Arnav. Hopefully, that should be a bit that should be a bit better for you. Okay. Okay. So, um, try max volume. Well, it's I can do that. It's you're going to get some feedback. It's probably going to you're going to hear the fan and stuff blowing in the background. That's about as loud as I'm ready as I'm willing to go. Okay, so um, we talked about these three estates in France, okay? These three estates um, are like social classes of people, all right? So if we took the whole society and we divided it up into percentages, we talked about how 97% of the population was what's part of, part of what's known as the third estate, okay? Now, the third estate, because it makes up such a huge percentage of the population, um, we have to kind of take the third estate and subdivide it into, um, into different groupings of the third estate. So within the third estate, what we talked about last time is that you had the, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, the workers, and the peasants, okay? But all three of these groups are within the third estate, okay? Now, what about the first and second estate? Remember that the first estate only makes up about 1% of the population, and the second estate only makes up about 2% of the population. So between these two estates, they only make up roughly 3% of the total population of France, okay? And the reason that that's significant is because these are the only two groups, that 3%, those are the only two groups that are really able to benefit from, um, you know, uh, posi holding positions in French government, tax breaks, things like that, all right? It's an unfair and very, very, very imbalanced society, all right? Uh, and what you had was you had this group of people, particularly the bourgeoisie, okay, in the third estate, 
who is going to be made up of relatively well-to-do, probably pretty talented overall individuals, educated individuals, all right, who, um, who are frustrated about the fact that they, they have to pay so much more in taxes that they are locked out of positions of government. They're not able to hold positions within the French government. And their influence in society is limited compared to, um, you know, the, the, the overall talent, ability, education, wealth that they possess, okay? And they are frustrated about that. So they begin to challenge using those same enlightenment principles that we were talking about that influenced our own independence from Britain, okay, in America, and influenced our Declaration of Independence and, and influenced the, the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, so on and so forth, three separate branches of government, checks and balances, equal punishments for equal crimes, equality before the law. All of these are ideas that are essentially um, used by the bourgeoisie in France to begin challenging these first and second estates at the top of society, okay? So we, current, we kind of started getting into this here. The third estate is inspired by the American Revolution. They're inspired by the Enlightenment. They start to the question the structure of French society, and they start to demand liberty, equality, and democracy. In fact, the, the, if I was to um, show you this, okay, okay, those are the French words and they should actually have little accent marks over them, but I don't know how to do that on my computer. Anyway, um, the point being liberté, égalité, fraternité, Okay, these are ideas that, that the, um, in French, they mean, you know, freedom, equality, and actually fraternity means brotherhood, okay? But these ideas are going to be the, the um, motto of the bourgeoisie in the French Revolution. Now, remember that the third estate, it, it makes up the majority of the people, but the bourgeoisie within the third estate are really going to be the people who are advocating for these ideals, all right? The bourgeoisie only makes up of the overall population of France, maybe somewhere in the area of about, oh, I don't know, five to eight, maybe maybe up to, if we're generous, about 10% of the population, okay? They, they're not the vast majority of the third estate. The, the bourgeoisie is the small, it's, they're like the upper middle class. Think of them as the upper middle class, all right? The workers and the peasants, the peasants in particular, make up 80% of the French population. Some peasants are slightly better off than others. Some are um, slightly worse off than others. The workers are generally the poorest group. They're usually landless. They're laborers, apprentices, servants in urban areas. All right? But the bourgeoisie is really going to be the group here within the third estate that starts to question the societal makeup of France. Peasants and workers don't have enough time in their day to be thinking about the political and economic structures of France, okay? But the bourgeoisie have more ability, more education, um, and, and they also have more wealth, which means that they're going to be the driving force behind inspiring change. And one of the other things that we mentioned towards the end of last class is how France started to get itself into some economic trouble towards the end of the uh, 18th century, the 1700s. The French economy at this point is in decline. The bourgeoisie is extremely concerned. In particular, the cost of living is going up really fast. One of the things, one of the, um, one of the social uh, things that we see happen, right, in Europe and in America in the 1700s is that we have enormous, enormous population growth, okay? Enormous population growth. And because the population is growing so much, all right, um, it is putting a strain on the economy to feed those people because keep in mind, we're living, we're, we're, we're talking right now 
in a, about an era that was before the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution allowed for a number of technological advancements, particularly related to agriculture, that allowed for more farms to, pr to produce more foods using, um, you know, land more efficiently, using new pieces of technology, all right? But in, the, in, the, in France, in the 1780s, those inventions don't exist yet, all right? Not to mention there's this whole bad weather slew where there's this unseasonably cold weather for many years that causes crops to die. And so on top of the fact that they were already struggling with creating enough food to feed this massive population growth, all right, they're also now struggling on another end of it, which is that the food that they were growing is lower in quantity because of famine, so crops failing, all right? And of course, when things that are in high demand, like food, okay, start to become scarce, the price for those things goes up. And so because the price of food skyrockets, and because the population is growing and property is now skyrocketing in value as well, that means that people's basic cost of living is increasing significantly, but the problem is, is that their, their, their pay, their wages, are not going up to match that, all right? France also is led by this guy, Louis the Sixteenth, and his wife, Marie Antoinette, who was this Austrian princess that he married years back, all right? Now, previous kings had already built up debt through wars, okay, particularly wars against the British. In 1786, the bankers in France, uh, and around France, outside of France even, um, Dutch bankers, Italian bankers, Swiss bankers, bankers that, that the French government was borrowing money from, cut them off. They said, we're not lending you any more money because you never pay it back. The French state is completely in debt and upside down, and their debt is only growing, okay? And so, you know, this is creating an economic crisis in France that's going to be very, very difficult for France to be able to take care of. Meanwhile, Louis XVI is just this weak king. He, he is easily influenceable. He doesn't have strong opinions on things. And the other thing that you have to remember about France at this time, the king doesn't live in Paris. He lives about 12 miles outside of Paris, all right? Why didn't people grow their own food? Well, in many cases, they did, Arnav, actually. A lot of um, peasants did subsistence-style farming back in those days, okay? But um, the problem was that weather was destroying people's crops. It's really hard to keep food alive in the pre-industrial era because they don't have things like miracle Grow. They don't have things like, you know, advanced irrigation systems or whatever. You know, it's just difficult to keep the food growing in a time where the weather is so bad. So Louis XVI is this weak king. He doesn't solve problems fast enough. He's very easily influenced by people around him. Marie Antoinette is no better. She gives bad advice. But like I said, they're living about 12 miles outside of Paris. They're living at the Palace of Versailles, which I showed you pictures of last unit. And the Palace of Versailles you know, it's only 12 miles away. 12 miles isn't that far, all right? It's, it's considerably farther when you don't have cars, which they didn't, okay? They only had horse-drawn carriages and stuff like that. But it's not very close to, to, France, to Paris, okay? Versailles is a, is a distance away. Even if today you were to take a train to Versailles, it's going to take you 30, 40 minutes to get there, okay? It, and so it, it's not super close, but Versailles may as well have been located on the moon, all right, because the, the experience of these royalty and of these nobles who are living at Versailles, the everyday experience that they have is one of luxury, 
it's one of of the nicest food, clothing, um, gardens, architecture. Okay, they're living, they're living this this you know amazing life, completely insulated from all of the problems that are affecting the French people that they have no experience or understanding of at all. Okay, the royal families in France at this time have their little routines, they do their little parties, they do their little dances. Marie Antoinette used to spend hours and hours and hours just having her hair done in all of these insane, crazy, um, you know, hairstyles, all right? They're, they're, you know, they're hunting because only nobles were allowed to go out and hunt and stuff like that. They're living these lives of luxury and have no ability to understand or empathize with the French people because they don't have, they don't have bad lives. Their, their lives at Versailles are completely insulated and um, and they have no experience of going hungry. They have no experience of not being able to spend money and stuff like that. All right. So there there's serious problems brewing in France in the 1770s and 80s. And here's those images of Marie Antoinette and uh, King Louis the 16th. Matters worsen, and the way that matters worsen is that rather than cutting back spending, which would be the rational decision, you know, if you, if you were realizing that your financial situation was completely out of control, you'd probably devote some energy and time into trying to fix those problems. You know what? Maybe we'll cut back spending. Maybe we'll try and get our, our budget balanced, okay? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he continues spending, and the royal family and the nobles basically wait until France is essentially broke, okay, basically bankrupt. And the way that he decides to go about handling this situation is he says, well, what if we imposed a tax on the nobility? Now, of course, the nobles, the second they hear that, they tense up, okay, because the whole point of being a noble in France was that you didn't pay taxes. That was the whole reason to become a noble in the first place, that and you got to have an influence in government. All right. So the second estate forces the king, once he suggests that, once he suggests that they're going to be taxed, they basically say, over our dead bodies are you going to tax us? We're going to force you to call a meeting of something called the Estates General. Now the Estates General was a meeting where representatives from each estate, the first estate, the second estate, and the third estate, come together and meet, okay? But the estates general had not been called in nearly two centuries, 175 years, that's a long time, all right? So, so the estates general, all right, comes together, and this assembly of representatives from each of these estates, then vote and decide if they're going to approve this tax or not. And the estate's general meeting happens on May 5th, 1789. And of course it happens at Versailles, the home of the king. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about this estate's general because it's very important to understand how the estate's general works. All right, so, the Estates General had been a practice that had been used in France going all the way back to the medieval era. The medieval rules of the Estates General was that you had a bunch of people, or a handful of people at least, we'll say, I don't know, somewhere in the area of, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 to 200 people from each estate come together and talk out the issues. And the first thing that they do is they write up a list of grievances. Each estate writes up a list of grievances that they want to solve, that they want to fix. All right. And, um, and so the way that uh, this went was that for all of those representatives, okay, here, let me, you know what, maybe, let me do this to help. 
to help demonstrate what I mean, okay? So let's say we had here, um, we'll do this, okay, and then we'll do this, right here-ish. Kind of looks like a French flag almost, actually. All right. So here's your first estate, okay? Here's your second estate, and here's your third estate. Okay, and this whole thing is, we'll just put this here because it's faster, estates general, all right? Okay, so here's your estate's general meeting. You got your first estate, you got your second estate, you got a third estate. All right. Now within that, all right, you've got do this. You've got a bunch of representatives. Okay, who come together. And then the third estate, because they're the largest estate, they're the ones who have the most representatives. So I'm just I'm just doing this as fast as I can here, which I know it doesn't look that nice, okay? But they're the people who have the most representatives, the most delegates, okay? These people within each of these, so this is the meeting, okay? So you've got a handful of people for the first estate, you've got a handful of people for the second estate, and then you've got a bunch of people for the third estate, all right? And they come together in this estate's general, and the first thing that they do is they come up with a list of grievances, and they compare their lists, all right? Now, if, if each of these peoples vote, okay, if each of these delegates vote was what was counted, all right, the third estate would have a huge advantage, right, because they have so many more delegates at the estate's general meeting, okay? However, that's not the way the voting works in the estate's general. The voting takes place in isolation of whether that it, for each estate. And based on each estate's vote, the estate's general meeting is then boiled down to three votes total, one for each estate, okay? So they don't take everybody together and count the votes. They take each estate in isolation, count the votes, determine what each estate said, and then they say, okay, Estate one voted here, estate voted, voted here, and estate three voted here. And the only way to get it passed is if two out of those three votes, okay, um, are a yes to change the law. Well, I wanna remind you what the issue is here. The issue that they're voting on is, should we tax the nobility, the second estate? Should we tax them? Think about how this is going to work. Think about how this is gonna work. The first estate, they're privileged. They only make up 1% of the population. The second estate is privileged. They only make up 2% of the population. The third estate is disenfranchised. They make up 97% of the population. And think about this system and how this is going to work. What's the first estate going to say when they are asked, do you want to pass a law that taxes the second estate? Well, because they're privileged, just like the second estate is, their vote is going to be no, okay? The second estate, of course, they don't want to see themselves get taxed. So once again, they vote on the issue. What's the result going to be? It's going to be no. The third estate, on the other hand, of course, has been taxed punishingly. What are they going to say when they are asked, do you think the second estate should be taxed? They're going to say, yes, exclamation point. Okay, yes, of course we want them to be taxed. But the problem is because it only comes down to three votes every single time the way the estate's general is going to happen, right, is that these guys, right here, okay, are always going to vote together, and these guys 
are always going to vote be outvoted. Okay? So so the estates general gets called together and the third estate from the very get-go says we should change the rules. We shouldn't make it so that it's only one vote per estate. We should make it so that it's one vote per delegate. Okay? So that everybody's votes get counted. But of course, the first and second estate and the king don't want to do that. And the king doesn't really want to tax the second estate. The only reason he's doing this is because he sees no other option. But in reality, the king in France needs to keep the support of the nobles. And so the king says, no, 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 no. We're not going to change the rules. We're going to do it the same way it's always been done. One vote per estate. And this is going to create a problem. Okay, If each delegate had a vote, the third estate would have the edge because they had the most delegates. So Louis XVI says, no, we're going to follow the old medieval rules. Now, oddly enough, if you were to look at each of these individual people within these estates, there were a handful of people who saw that France had some problems, okay? And they would have voted in favor of taxing the second estate. Even maybe some nobles may have been in may have been okay with it. Probably the vast majority know though. But of course the vast majority of these folks over here want to see a fairer tax system in place that will lift the burden off of them a little bit and distribute that burden across these other two really wealthy segments of society. All right? And one of the guys who was in the first estate who would have voted along with the third estate over here, we'll say it's this dot right here, okay? This guy was a guy named Emmanuel Joseph Siez. Emmanuel Joseph Siez was a clergyman. He was part of the first estate, and he supported the third estate. He even makes a speech to the third estate. And in that speech, he basically says that the third estate should stop referring to themselves as the third estate, okay? That the third estate should start calling themselves the National Assembly. In other words, the group of people representing the majority of the French population, all right? And, and he basically says, you guys are the, you are the people of France. You are the people who should be making decisions about the future of France. And this is, again, it's coming out of frustration. It's coming out of seeing France in a really fragile economic position. It's seeing that the king is pretty inept, okay? He's, he's pretty unable to fulfill his duties as king because he's kind of a dummy, okay? And so what ends up happening, all right, is that on June 17th, the delegates of the third estate these people right here come together, all right, and they hold a vote. And they say, do you want to start calling ourselves the National Assembly and start making laws on behalf of the people in France? And they overwhelmingly vote yes. So on June 17th, 1789, about a month and a half, after the start of the Estates General meeting, they vote to throw off the title of third estate and start calling themselves the National Assembly and say, we should be the ones making the rules around here. Three days later, on June 20th, the third estate's delegates show back up to the Palace of Versailles to go to their daily Estates General meetings. Okay? And when they get there, they realize that they have been locked out of the estate's general meeting. And they immediately are furious. They, they are locked out and they decide to go to a near door, uh, nearby indoor tennis court. Okay? They break down the door. They go inside this 
large room and they basically start giving speeches one by one different people stand up and start giving speeches very passionate fiery speeches about freedom okay liberty equality democracy talking about the enlightenment principles and all of this stuff and every single one of their speeches ends by saying and we're not leaving until we get a new constitution okay so all these speeches finish the same way we're not leaving until we get a new constitution just like Britain had developed about a hundred years earlier all right and this became known as the tennis court oath the tennis court oath we're not leaving until we get a constitution and even because probably some of them were afraid some nobles and clergymen who were in favor of reform go out to the tennis court and they join the third estates delegates and they start making speeches too saying you guys are right now are they doing that out of fear or are they doing it because they actually believe it well I'll let you decide that all right but but nonetheless you do even still have a handful of people from the first and second estate we'll say a couple people here couple people here whoops couple people here right who end up kind of coming over to the third estate and saying hey we're not part of the third estate but we are in support of getting a new constitution as well all right and this is an image here of what the tennis court oath looked like roughly as you can see it's pretty pretty much chaos it's pandemonium okay you have people there who are you know quite it's and of course this is all men because you know it's a very patriarchal society in Europe at this time all right but these are all French dudes coming together here you can see a couple of clergy members and so on who are who are in the room with them maybe one of them is Emmanuel Joseph Siez okay with that clergy member here's this guy he's a little bit frazzled over here he's kind of freaking out rocking himself in the corner okay but these people are giving speeches and they literally stand on the table and give these speeches and people are freaking out in the third estate saying we're not leaving until we get a new constitution and this is really what begins the French Revolution all right but you got to remember the French Revolution wasn't really started by the third estate technically it was started in some sense by the nobles because they were the ones who forced the king to call together the estates general in the first place after all none of this would have happened if the estates general meeting hadn't been called all right so as we move forward the king he hears about what's going on and he starts to get a little nervous right because you've got this really fiery impassioned group of third estate people who are making all these speeches about liberty and all this stuff and so the king hires some mercenary guards okay Swiss guards mercenaries those are paid soldiers so they're not even French they're Swiss guards and he stations these Swiss guards around the palace of Versailles to offer more protection well these rumors start flying around Paris about the king's intentions you know and you know how rumors work if you've ever played that game what's the name of that game telephone okay where where you start a rumor on one side of the class and then and then people um, one by one share the rumor with somebody else and by the end of the class okay by the time you get that rumor passes through 30 different people you have a totally different rumor than the one that you started with usually more um, emotional usually um, containing some misinformation and stuff like that all right so rumors start flying around Paris about the king's intentions all right and and um, people in Paris start hearing about the fact that the king has stationed these mercenary guards around Versailles and basically people are like freaking out like oh my gosh is he going to use these guards and slaughter people is he going is he going to wage a war against the people of Paris are we going to civil war right now what is the king going to do with this mercenary army that he has hired in Versailles so people in Paris start getting afraid 
Now remember, Paris is about 12 miles away or so from Versailles. So they don't know exactly what's going on over in Versailles, but they don't like hearing that the king has gathered a mercenary army. And so they respond by gathering weapons in Paris. And things in Paris start boiling over and getting extremely crazy. On July 14th, a giant angry mob, so people in Paris were allowed to have guns, but they weren't allowed to have gunpowder. They needed gunpowder to be able to fire their weapons. So they start scouring Paris for gunpowder. And there was this old medieval castle. It's no longer there. It got ripped down during the French Revolution. This old medieval dungeon, this old medieval castle made out of stones called the Bastille. Okay, Bastille or Bastille. Okay, and they go to this old medieval prison which had guards in it. Okay, and this mob kills the commander of the prison and many guards, but they don't just kill them. It gets insane. They cut their heads off. They decapitate them. They put their heads onto these large spear things called pikes. It is getting extremely violent, all right? They storm the prison. They search for gunpowder. And, and once they've taken over the prison, they literally start ripping the prison apart brick by brick. All right? Things in Paris are going insane right now. And just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea of how far removed the king was from reality. Remember I told you he's living all the way over in Versailles in his little palace over there with his little guards surrounding it. He may as well have been living on the moon. That day, the very same day that that the French Revolution has broken out in Paris and people storm the Bastille. On that day, Louis XVI, King of France, went hunting in the massive, massive forest gardens in Versailles. He's gone hunting all day. Now, Louis XVI kept a diary and historians recovered this diary. They decided to look up, I wonder what the king was thinking on July 14th when he wrote in his diary on that day in Paris. I wonder what the king's response to it was. Do you know what they found when they opened up his diary and they flipped to his entry for July 14th? He made an entry. He made an entry on that day. July 14th, 1789, the king wrote exactly one word in his diary, and that word was nothing. Nothing. He wrote nothing. The word, it's not that he was so busy he didn't write anything in the diary. He made a diary entry and wrote the word nothing. And the reason he wrote the word nothing is in reference to the fact that on that day, he went hunting and he did not kill any animals, okay? And that gives you an idea of just how far removed the king was from what was happening on his doorstep just 12 miles away over in Paris, which is full-blown chaos. It's revolt. It's a revolution, okay? so. The mob takes control of the prison. They cut, they cut the heads off the guards. They start parading around Paris. And people in Paris, of course, many of whom are in the Third Estate, start to view this tearing down, the storming of the Bastille. They see it as a symbolic act of revolution because the, the Bastille was this old feudal medieval prison that symbolically represented all of the things that had really created the problems in France in the first place. So, so whereas here in the United States, when we, when we celebrate um, Independence Day, July 4th, which was the start of the American Revolution, the French celebrate July 14th, which is known as Bastille Day, 
in France. It's very similar to our to our July 4th. It's the it's the beginning of the French Revolution. Now, after the storming of the Bastille, very quickly, this revolution starts to spread out to the countryside. All right, and here's some artistic representations of what the Bastille used to look like. And you can see all these people here with these spears. These are pikes. Okay, these are pikes. Um, <laughs> yes, Arnav, I, I, I remember. Have a long time ago we talked about food shortage happening soon. Yeah, that was just a couple weeks ago. History is about to repeat itself again. Time to stock up on food and grow food before it goes down. Well, it's always good to have stores of food, right? It's always good to have stores of food. All right, and here's another artistic representation of the storming of the Bastille. And as you can see, it's this old medieval castle dungeon looking thing. Okay, and they start tearing it down. They start firing cannons into it and stuff like that. All right. So a wave of senseless panic. After the storming of the Bastille, over the course of the next couple of months, okay, a wave of senseless panic rolls throughout France. And this became known as the Great Fear. Now, don't get that confused with another term that we're going to be talking about later, known as the Reign of Terror. Terror and fear are kind of similar words, but when we're talking about the Great Fear, we're still in the early, early, early months of the French Revolution when we talk about the Great Fear. And all it was was this wave of senseless panic that rolled through all of France, particularly in the countryside, where peasants lived. Because remember, peasants live on farmlands in rural areas. Paris is an urban area. It's a city. So most of the people there are going to be bourgeois members. They're going to be um, urban workers and so on. All right? So peasants become outlaws. They arm themselves with even simple farm tools, pitchforks and other things like that, shovels and so on. All right. They break into the nobles' houses, because remember, the nobles own the land that the peasants live on. And the peasants would go and break into their houses, burn their houses down, rip up feudal contracts. All right. So the peasants are starting to become outlaws because they are jumping on board with this giant wave of panic that has started to spread across the countryside. So we're seeing pandemonium break loose in France. By October, later that year, okay, by October, women play an important role in the French Revolution. In Paris, Paris, there's a massive river that runs through Paris. It's known as the Seine River, S-E-I-N-E, -E, the Seine River, all right? The, Seine, the River Seine had a number of docks along it, and it was very common for women to work. You know, there were women laborers in Paris, and there was this group of, of female dock workers. It was also common for women, regardless of what class you were a part of, what a state, um, but it was also common for women to do the shopping. And women of anyone would have been the ones to be able to know the price of bread, okay, the, the rising cost of bread, and um, the fact that their wages weren't going up fast enough to be able to afford food for their families and stuff, okay. And so in October, thousands of women in Paris begin to riot over the rising costs of bread. And in particular, this really group, this really fearsome group of women who are strong women, they're workers, right? They're dock workers. So they're used to, you know, physical exertion. They're used to lifting up heavy crates and stuff like that. They march to Versailles, this angry mob of women marches to Versailles, the king's palace, okay? They get to Versailles, they kill the guards, and they start tearing through the palace of Versailles, ripping it to shreds in search of Louis and Marie Antoinette. And originally when they went there, their original goal was to find the king and queen and murder them, all right? But keep in mind, Versailles is enormous, and the march to Versailles is a 12-mile march. It's not exactly a short distance. So they get there. They can't find the king and queen right away. They're searching all over the palace, searching for the king and queen. They can't find them. 
until later on that day. And they basically take the king and queen hostage, all right, rather than killing them. They take them hostage, all right. They put them into a carriage and they march the king and queen away from Versailles back to Paris and demand the king and queen to take action and start making changes. So the king and queen survive this um, march to Versailles, all right, in, in October of 1789. Um, but that was the last time that they ever saw Versailles. For the rest of the French Revolution, they were kept in Paris. They were put into a different palace, which also is no longer there. It burned down in the 1800s. They were put into a different palace known as Tuileries Palace. Tuileries Palace. All right. And that's where the king and queen stayed until later. And we'll talk about what happens to them later. Going back just a little bit. So that happened in October of 1789. Going back to August, just a couple months earlier, nobles began making speeches about their love for liberty and equality. But why would they start doing that? Well, the nobles didn't remember. The nobles were the ones who, who refused to accept a new tax. So now these, after they see all of this chaos oh, that's happened in Paris over the course of a, a month or so, okay, they, they start making speeches. Why are they doing it? Well, they're probably more motivated by fear because they were heavily, heavily outnumbered by the Third Estate heavily outnumbered by angry urban workers, angry peasants, all right? And the National Assembly at that time says, we are getting rid of the estates general. We are, or I mean, the, uh, the old regime, the ancient regime. We're getting rid of the estates system. We're doing away with the first and second estate, all right? So the third estate now no longer is calling themselves the third estate. They now call themselves the National Assembly. The National Assembly votes to get rid of the first and second estate. And the old regime is dead. Three weeks later, the National Assembly continuing to work, okay, to start to initiate changes in France. Three weeks later, the National Assembly creates a new document known as the Declarations, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is actually the full title of it, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, all right? And this Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen was very similar. It kind of, it was inspired by the Declaration of Independence. It was inspired by this point by the American Constitution. It was inspired by the English Bill of Rights and the National Assembly creates this Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen using all of those same Enlightenment principles that we used when we wrote the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And in this Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen stated that all men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Very similar language to the Constitution and the uh, Declaration of Independence. And what were the rights of citizens? The rights included liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Again, the same ideas inspired by John Locke, Voltaire, all right, those kinds of guys. And it also granted the freedom of speech and religion to the people of France. The National Assembly, after they do away with the first and second estate. Remember that the first and second estate, one of the reasons that they were so wealthy is because they had a bunch of land. And land in France uh, was, you know, was the same as wealth. And the first and second estate, despite the fact that the first and second estate together combined, they only made up about 3% of the population. They held about 30% of the lands of France. So we have a huge, huge, huge amount of land in France. About a third of the territory in France was controlled by the first and second estate. And when the National Assembly passes the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen and gets rid of the ancient regime, the first and second estates, 
They basically say, since you guys are no longer recognized, we are taking your lands away from you and we are converting them into property of the French state. Okay, so the Roman Catholic Church loses its lands, it loses its political independence, and the proceeds from that, okay, from, the, from taking the church lands, start to help to pay off the French debt. They basically start to use the land to pay off the debt that, was, that had become such a problem in France. Now, this move, I have to tell you, was one of the moves of the Third Estate where we begin to see disagreement within the Third Estate, within the National Assembly, okay? Because peasants, peasants, generally speaking, are very devout Catholics, all right? They're very religious. And peasants, remember that the French Revolution is mostly initiated by the bourgeoisie, the people who are educated, the people who live in Paris, the people who already are somewhat wealthy, even though their status was considered unfair and they were taxed unfairly. But the peasants disagree with the bourgeoisie-led National Assembly about taking the lands from the church. The peasants start to oppose the National Assembly because they are thinking that that's going too far. We can't just take the church lands. The church was important to them. Their faith is important to them. So the peasants, once the, once the Roman Catholic Church loses its lands, the peasants kind of start to question, hmm, I wonder what direction the National Assembly is going here. We don't really want to see the church attacked the way that the National Assembly is attacking them by taking their lands. It's at this time, or actually shortly thereafter, okay, um, I'm jumping forward in the story, a little bit here to June 1791. So by this point, the French Revolution has been going on for about two years. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette have been held on house arrest at Tuileries Palace for this entire time. And remember that Marie Antoinette was from Austria. So their plan was, okay, and if you look at, I should probably show you this so you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Let me pull up a map here. Okay, here's a map of Paris, give you an idea of where we're talking about here. So here's Paris, okay? Paris is the capital of, of France, all right? And here's France. You can see France is quite large. And like I said, Versailles is located, it's outside of Paris. It's kind of on the outskirts over here, all right, to the west. But they have been held in Paris, and their plan was, let's escape, okay? Let's escape. And so, and we'll, what we'll do is we will escape and we will go over to, at the time, the map didn't look like this, the borders were different in, in Europe in the 1700s, but we're going to go over to Austria, and Austria on a modern day map is over here. Here's Vienna, capital of Austria, okay? We're going to escape. So the French king and queen decide, we're sick of this, we're freaked out, we're going to run away, and they run over to... Where, can, where is it? Um, let's find it. This should be... Oh, it was close. You see that? I'm pretty, pretty close. Okay, here's Varenne. All right. They escape. So they, they leave, they leave Paris and they head east okay, to go to Varennes. And here's Varennes, okay? Varennes just this small little town, okay, east of Paris, all right? So you can see relative, here's how far they got. If we zoom the map out, okay, where the, where the arrow is there, okay, there's Varennes. Zoom the map out. You can see that they've gone from Paris all the way over here. So they make it a decent distance, okay, but they get stopped in Varennes. They get stopped right here in Varennes. And when they're caught, and Varennes was pretty close to the border. See, they only had to go a little bit more 
here's the border of France, okay? They only had to go a little farther and they would have been probably, um, you know, safe in their escape. But they get stopped. And the um, people recognize, oh my gosh, the people, the guards that stop them, they say, oh my gosh, the king and queen are trying to flee France. And Louis XVI is expecting that people are going to like bow before him and stuff like that. And they're like, no, are you insane? We're in the middle of the biggest revolution that French, France has ever seen. We're in a major crisis right now. And your, your solution to that is to try to escape France, to abandon your country. So he gets caught. They say, we're bringing you back. You're a prisoner. And now, a lot of people who may not have made up their mind yet about the king or the revolution, now that they start to hear that the king tried to leave, they're even angrier with him. And by this point, his fate is sealed, meaning that, that, that he has completely lost all credibility. He's lost the faith of the people and they are going to look to execute him, okay? They are going to attempt to um, try and execute their own king, all right? We start to see some divisions develop at this time, all right? In 1791, September of 1791, the National Assembly, which is still the, the power, the group of, of noble or of uh, bourgeois third estate people that are in power, finally complete their new constitution. Remember, they had been talking about for a long time, we're going to create a new constitution. The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen was more just like a Bill of Rights sort of a thing. But they needed to come up with a new blueprint for how this government was going to look in France. And what they were trying to do was to create a similar government to England initially, okay? They were trying to simply keep the king, but limit his power. Remember that the Magna Carta, as far back as 1215 in England, had limited the power of the king. And as time went on in England, they continued to strip more and more and more uh, authority away from the king. And so the, the National Assembly is going to try to create a constitution similar to Britain's constitution, all right, that keeps a king, but it's now no longer an absolute monarchy. It'll be a constitutional monarchy where the king's power would be stripped. Now, of course, Louis XVI doesn't want to sign this. No king wants to sign an agreement that's going to take their power away from them. But the reason that he signs it is because he doesn't have a choice. It's either sign it or be executed. And what this did is it, it basically, um, that once the, once the king signs the constitution, approving this governmental blueprint, all right, that the National Assembly had written, it was always in the plan, it was always the plan that the National Assembly once they completed the Constitution and got it signed by the king, that the National Assembly would dissolve, okay, that, that the National Assembly would, would go away, and that a new body of representatives would be created known as the Legislative Assembly. Okay, so this new Constitution in France created a new representative body called the Legislative Assembly, and it was supposed to be a more permanent solution, because the National Assembly was just a temporary thing to write a constitution while things were crazy, and now this is supposed to be, okay, we've come up with a new constitution, let's put this into place, the National Assembly will dissolve, and we'll have this brand new legislative assembly that will create laws and approve or reject war. Now, the king technically under this constitution that was developed still had the power to enforce the laws but there was a lot more privileges about who could serve in government and things like that, all right? But France, it's only been a few years, and the economy in France hasn't yet been fixed, okay? They had started to fix it by paying down some debts and stuff like that, but they still are struggling with a major food shortage in France. They're still causing, they're still having problems with debt, okay? 
And what this did was as soon as they created the legislative assembly, okay, so they create this, I'm going to create a new little thing for you here. So let's get it, let's do a new one here. Don't save that. Okay, so they create a new a new thing here. So let's uh, let's do this. So let's say that this is um, like an assembly hall, almost like a theater or something like that. Okay. All right, and you would say let's say you'd have like the speaker standing right here in the assembly, okay? What we start to see happen is that here's the new legislative assembly, okay? Brand new legislative, legislative assembly. All right, and remember, this is the thing that's going to be replacing the national assembly, which had been writing the constitution and coming up with a new blueprint for how the government is going to operate. The Legislative Assembly, is, as soon as it comes into existence, okay, we see some divisions develop within the, the Legislative Assembly. Okay? And there's going to be some people in the Legislative Assembly who we will consider, whoops, who we will consider to be um, more radical. Whoops, let me do that. All right, we're going to see over here on the, oh man, did I just do that again? There, okay. Over on this side, I'm going to color that red, okay? Why? Because on the left side of the assembly, you had radicals, all right? On the right side, I'm going to color that blue. These were people who were more conservative, okay? We might call them royalists, okay? People who were a little bit hesitant about making a bunch of change. And then in the middle, you had moderates. People who wanted some change but not a lot of change, okay? The radicals are gonna be the ones that want the most change. The conservatives are gonna to wanna to be the ones who, have, who see the least change. And then you've got people in the middle who are kind of between both sides. Some change, but not that much change, okay? And because of these divisions, what happens is in the legislative assembly, people who start to identify more with the radicals okay, sit up over here on this side. The most radical members of the Legislative Assembly are going to be sitting over up in this corner over here, as far over to the left as possible, demonstrating that these people wanted the most change. And then the people over on this side were the people who wanted the least amount of change, all right? Now, there was a group of people who started to develop in this part over here called the Jacobins, okay? The Jacobins were over on the far left side of the Legislative Assembly chamber. And these are the people who want to see the most radical changes in France and the most implementation of the Enlightenment principles, okay? And that's where they sit. Royalists and other people who are more in support of the king are going to sit over on this side. People who, who may have even wanted to restore the king to an absolute status. Okay, So we've got people of a bunch of different viewpoints that are coming together in the legislative assembly. And the thing is, is when you have people who have different ideas, different opinions, it's going to create conflict between these groups about how to solve these problems down here, okay? How to solve these problems down here. How are we going to solve the food shortage? They might have different opinions on how to go about solving that problem. How are we going to solve the debt? Again, 
We're going to have different opinions here. All right? So these divisions, like I say, the left, radicals who sat on the left side of the hall wanted major changes to everything. All right? In the center, you had moderates who sat in the center who wanted some changes. And on the right, you had conservatives who sat on the right side. They wanted to keep a limited monarchy and have fewer changes made to the French government. All right? As the rest of Europe, see, you know, people, it's not like this is just happening in a vacuum in France, okay? The rest of Europe is looking over at France and saying, what the heck is going on over there? It's chaos going on in France. And the rest of Europe at this time, going back to my European map, you know, the rest of Europe at this time, aside from England, okay, aside from, from Britain, okay, Pretty much everywhere else in Europe has an absolute monarchy. And at the time, that included the German states, the largest of which was Prussia. They had a really powerful military. Austria was a big one, okay? Austria used to have all these territories over here, okay? The, these absolute monarchies in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe start looking over at France and getting concerned. Because what they're afraid of is that these revolutionary people in Paris, that those ideas are going to spread over into Germany, over into Austria, and that these ideas are going to, you know, potentially create revolutions in their countries. And of course, they don't want that to happen. They want to retain control over their countries. So the governments of Austria and Prussia start pressuring the French Legislative Assembly to put Louis XVI back in power as an absolute monarch, to rip up their constitution, okay? To get rid of these changes, to say, okay, look, you, had, you made your point, now it's time to go back to the way things used to be. And you can imagine what their reaction to that is going to be, which is, heck no, we're not doing that. We're sick and tired of the way things used to be. We need change. And so the Le Legislative Assembly declares war just, you know, eight months maybe after they sign this new constitution. And they declare war against both Prussia and Austria, which again is going to be scary for France because they already have chaos inside their country. And now they're going to be inviting chaos to invade them from outside their country, from foreign powers. So France is going to be in a really, really tough spot here in 1792. The war does not start out well for France. They're already struggling from within. And then you had this Prussian commander, okay, this Prussian military commander. Prussia, remember, turns into Germany eventually who threatens to destroy Paris if the royal family is harmed. He basically sends a threat to the people in Paris, okay? And he says, look, if you harm the king, if you mistreat the king or anyone in the royal family, we are going to absolutely level Paris. And you can imagine, again, this is not going to go over well with the people in the legislative assembly, all right? So, that is where we will leave our story off for today. All right, folks? Um, but before we go, what I would like to have you do is to make sure that you log into Canvas to do your daily assignment, okay? And that daily assignment will be due on Thursday morning. So please do get your work done. Please don't have late assignments and other things like that. Make sure that you get it done, and I'll be um, checking those assignments, and I'll put all the instructions in there for you just as soon as I am able, and that will be available for you to complete sometime between now and Thursday morning. All right, folks, that does it for today. If you log into Canvas and get your assignment done, you will get attendance credit for today. Have a great rest of the day.